Hey guys, Miss Marisa here, and in this video we're going to be looking at an introduction to solutions. How do we identify a solution from a particle diagram? How do we tell if two substances will dissolve in each other and make a solution? As well as, once we know that substances make a solution, how would we illustrate the interactions that would occur between the substances in the solution? So to start us off here, we have a chart that probably looks familiar. It's our basic classification of matter flowchart. And with that said, you notice our four categories down here of substances, homogeneous mixtures, solutions, heterogeneous mixtures, compounds, and elements. Um, compounds and elements, we recognize the fact that it is a pure substance. It only has one type of particle in it, although with a compound, our particles have different elements bonded together. However, when I'm dealing with my mixtures, I should see two different types of particles. So the key way to kind of tell a solution, a homogeneous mixture, from a heterogeneous one is how is the composition of those particles distributed. On a heterogeneous mixture, I should notice clumping. I, I don't get an even distribution. You notice here we have specifically layers of substances, one on top of each other. However, with the solution, I should see an even distribution of particles throughout my substance. Now, one of the other things that we want to remember about mixtures is that it, they can be physically separated. And we're going to talk next class about some of those methods of physical separation that we we could use. So again, if you want to pick out a solution from other particle diagrams, first off, you're looking for a substance that can be physically separated, um, but also you're looking for a uniform composition. And if we see both of those, then we're going to have our solution. So let's talk about how do we form solutions. Obviously, I would put two substances together, and if they dissolve, yay, I get my solution. But sometimes I can put two substances together and they don't dissolve in each other. So we have to have a set of guidelines to follow to figure out if I put two things together, will they dissolve or not? Now, usually one of the components of a solution is water. We will see that very commonly throughout AP Chemistry that we will be making solutions that would have water as our solvent. Part of the reason why it goes by the name universal solvent is because water dissolves such a wide variety of things and it is typically used as the solvent. So notice that down here we're going to be talking about whether or not a substance will be soluble in water or not. If our substance is ionic we can use solubility rules. You notice here a lovely table of all kinds of various categories that we can follow through to figure out if an ionic compound Will be soluble and we'll practice using this chart here in a little bit. Different textbooks will have kind of different versions of this chart even though they should have the same basic information. However, for the AP test, what you would want to make sure that you know is that all group 1, ammonium, and nitrate ionic compounds are soluble. If you look back up here, you'll notice that is the first three rules that we see up here, and there's no exceptions to that. So once we see that a substance is soluble, then that would mean it would get the AQ designation, that it would dissolve in water. Now, technically, you can use this chart for any kind of polar solvent. Um, if you have a polar solvent and it follows these guidelines, then the ionic should dissolve in it, whether it's water or not. By the way, something interesting is that ionic compounds do not dissolve in nonpolar covalence. So we'll kind of see a little bit more with that next time when we talk about these with intermolecular forces. So if our substance is covalent, we can't use that table up there. Instead, we have to use the rule like dissolves like, which probably sounds familiar from pre-P. We use this quite a bit. Um, it says that polar compounds dissolve polar compounds, while nonpolars also dissolve nonpolar. However, if you have something that's polar and something that's nonpolar, for example, water and oil, then those two will not mix. The polarity needs to be the same. This does have to do with intermolecular forces, so we are going to revisit this idea next time. So let's say I have some substances and I'm trying to figure out if they're soluble or insoluble in water. One of the first things I would need to do is to figure out would I use the ionic guidelines or would I use the covalent guidelines. So let's start off here with potassium carbonate. I would first want to ask myself, well, is this ionic or covalent? 
I see that I have a metal poly ion combination. That eight tells me that I have a poly ion. And so if I have a metal polyatomic ion, I know that this compound is ionic. So now I can say, well, that would mean I would want to use those top solubility rules that we saw in the chart. Now for this one, let's first ask ourselves if maybe we can use the rules that we have to memorize for the AP test, which say all group one ammonium and nitrate ionics are soluble. Let's see if maybe we can use that rule to figure this one out. And so I would want to ask myself, is potassium in group one? So I go pull out my periodic table. And I see, lo and behold, that potassium is in group 1. So regardless of what it's with, we would assume here that this compound would be soluble in water. All right, let's look at the next one here. Methane has the formula of CH4, so it is covalent. And so once I see that it's covalent, I would then want to ask myself, is it polar or nonpolar? Now, I bet with this one, since it's all carbons and hydrogens, you could kind of reason this one out. But just in case you couldn't, remember, you can always draw a quick structure of it. Methane would look something like so. And so we see that it is indeed nonpolar. So being nonpolar as a molecule then that means it would be insoluble in water. All right, let's look at our next one, magnesium nitrate. First thing I would do is ask myself if it's ionic or covalent. I see I have a metal poly ion combination. So again, I know that this is ionic. Next, I would want to say, well, what rule would I use? Well, I would use my top table. However, I see it doesn't fit the group one ammonium category, but it does fit the nitrate category. And as we already said, nitrate ionic salts are soluble. So this one too will be soluble. All right, let's look at the next row. Ammonia. If you're not familiar with ammonia, ammonia has the formula of NH3. And so I can see that that would be a covalent compound. And so instead of using the top table, the top set of rules, I would want to use here the rule that like dissolves like. So again, I need to know some information about the polarity of ammonia. Now this is another one that I bet we are slightly familiar with the structure of it. Ammonia looks something like so. And so I can see that this being unsymmetrical would end up being polar. And so therefore, since it is polar, it would be soluble in water. All right, let's look at our next one, aluminum perchlorate. For aluminum perchlorate, um, I would first ask myself, is it ionic or covalent? Well, I have a metal poly ion combination, so it is ionic. Okay, so the next thing I would want to do is say, hey, what set of rules would I use? Well, I'm going to use the top table since it's ionic. I wouldn't use a polar nonpolar situation to figure this out. And so let's see if our rules that we have to memorize for AP would work. Well, this is not a group one or an ammonium or a nitrate. And so therefore I can't use that set of rules. So this is where I could come up and use this table if I needed to. So the way that this table works is you work your way down this first column. And as soon as you find a category that applies, you would read over to see if there's any exceptions. So for aluminum perchlorate, I would say, well, I already know I don't have a group one ammonium or nitrate. However, I see here acetate, chlorate, and lo and behold, perchlorate. ClO4 negative one is perchlorate. I also notice that there are no exceptions to that rule. So that means any compound that has perchlorate in it is soluble, and so it would get an AQ designation if I was writing it in, say, some sort of compound. All right, last but not least over here with silver bromide. Again, I would ask myself if it's ionic or covalent. I see I have a metal non-metal combination here. IDE endings usually tell me non-metals with the exception of hydroxide and cyanide. And so being ionic, I again know I'm going to use that top table to figure it out. Now, one quick thing on here. I'm going to check it to see if I could use my guidelines I have to remember for the AP test. 
I don't have a group one or ammonium or nitrate, so I'm gonna come up to the rest of this table and see if I can figure it out from there. So going through, I don't have a group one, I don't have ammonium, I don't have nitrate, we already checked those. I don't have acetate, chlorate, or perchlorate. I do, however, if you notice, have bromide, which I see right here in this rule. So I know that this is the rule I'm going to use. Now, most bromide compounds are soluble, but there are some exceptions. So let's see if we have one of those. I come over here and I say, oop, look at there. I have silver as one of the exceptions. So what that means is that while most bromide salts are soluble, silver bromide is not. So this one would be insoluble. By the way, a couple other things about this chart up here. Basically, if none of these other rules apply and I get through the hydroxide rule, I double check that one, this last rule says that anything else, any other monatomic and polyatomic anions would be insoluble. Unless it was with group one or ammonium, and hello, you should have checked that off the bat. Those are literally the first two rules, right? So if you get through the rest of this and you get to the bottom here, everything else should be insoluble. By the way, obviously you may or may not get this on the AP test. You would be expected, as I already mentioned, to know that group one ammonium and nitrate salts are soluble. So if you needed some information from this chart, they might give you a modified version of it or they might give you some inf more information in the problem to let you know who is insoluble and who is soluble. So they'd have to give you a little bit more information there. However, I will warn you, on our practice worksheets that we use in class, I typically will use examples that don't fall into the category of these three, and so you will often find yourself needing to reference this solubility chart. So just keep that in mind that even though you might not be using it full-blown on the AP test, you are expected to be able to use this chart for our examples in class. So hopefully we feel confident now with answering whether or not compounds are soluble or not. Once we see that compounds are soluble in each other, then what we would want to do is be able to illustrate what those interactions look like. So to see that, let's go ahead and flip to the next page. And it asks, how can we represent the process of dissolving using images? Um, and it gives us a couple of definition words that we want to familiarize ourselves here with. The first of those is hydration. Hydration is the process where polar ends of water will interact with cations and anions in an ionic compound. Now, for an ionic compound, we see here NaCl as an example. Here's our water, and what's going to happen is as water comes up to this, it's going to start to pull apart the attractive forces that are in this crystal. Basically what happens is if a substance does indeed dissolve, the attraction to the water is much stronger than the attraction that those ions had to each other, which is what causes the dissolving to take place. Now we're going to practice a lot more with that next class in deciding when would attractions be strong enough to be pulled apart or not. Obviously I could use the rules to figure out if they're soluble, but we're going to really emphasize those attractive forces next class and do some practice with that. Now let's say that this water is strong enough to pull apart the attractive forces in the NaCl, what it would do is it would take this ionic compound and split it up into ions. And when a compound dissolves specifically into ions, because it was made of ions, we call that process dissociation. So you notice here that what happens is that the waters basically surround the cation anion, but it does so in a very strategic way. If you notice around the positive sodium, the negative oxygen end of the water molecules surround it, whereas with the negative chlorine, the positive hydrogen ends of the water surround it. So that water really does orient itself in a very specific way. Now I know we said we're gonna talk a lot more about IMFs next time, but I wanna talk about the attractions that are forming here. We would actually call those attractions ion dipole intermolecular forces for the attraction between the ion itself and the dipole moment of the polar water molecule. So we're gonna kind of practice with that term a lot more next class. All right, now this works if we have an ionic. If we have a covalent, we don't show that interaction quite in the same way. 
Reason why is I don't dissociate into ions. It wouldn't split up into NaNCl because it's not made of ions to begin with. So for covalence, rather than showing those ions split up, we simply show the ends of the molecule attracting. So it says here with covalent compounds, we must assign partially positive and negative ends based on electronegativity. And then what we would do is we would attract our positive and negative ends together. Remember, unlike charges attract. Now, when we show that attraction, just like we've done previously, we would show that attraction with a dotted or dashed line to show that it is a force and not a bond. So even though this is hydrogen bond, remember hydrogen bond is a force of attraction not an intramolecular bond, not a bond inside of the molecule. All right, let's see this in action. These are actually both examples that were on actual AP test. So if you wanted to kind of see what types of questions they could ask on the FRQs for these types of problems, this is what they would look like. And for this first example here, it says we have a complete Lewis dot diagram of methanol, which is also known as formaldehyde, used to preserve uh, biological specimens. Um, and it says it's shown in the box below. It says molecules of methanol can form hydrogen bonds with water. In the box, draw a water molecule in a correct orientation to illustrate a hydrogen bond between a molecule of water and the molecule of methanol. Now, the first thing I would want to do is really ask myself, okay, is this ionic or covalent? Hopefully we can see that this is covalent. And so what that means is that my illustration is going to look something more like this versus being ionic and splitting up those ions. Okay. Now the next thing I would want to do is remind myself of exactly what ends of water have partially positive and partially negative. So as a reminder on how that works, here's my basic structure for water. I would think about which of those elements is more electronegative. And for water, oxygen, being right next door to fluorine, would be more electronegative than hydrogen. So hopefully we remember that oxygen is the partially negative end and the hydrogens are the partially positive end. However, I can do that same exact thing on this molecule here. For a moment, let's kind of think about our bond dipole overall moment here, okay? And we're going to actually address the individual bonds to figure out the overall molecule. Between carbon and hydrogen, Carbon is closer to fluorine, so I would predict it to have the higher electronegativity. So on that bond, we would be pulling toward the carbon on both of those. And then carbon to oxygen, as we already said, oxygen is right next door to fluorine, so it's going to have the higher electronegativity in comparison to carbon. So I'm again going to get a pull this direction. So my overall pull here my overall dipole moment would be in this direction. Now what that means is that the hydrogen end of this molecule is partially positive. The oxygen end would be partially negative. So I did need to take the time to figure out what the appropriate ends of this molecule would be. Once I've done that, I can now show how the water would interact. Now when you do this, you actually kind of have two options on placing a water molecule. And on this question on the AP test, they accepted either or. What you could do is on the oxygen end, that's partially negative, you could attract the partially positive hydrogen end to it. So so I could come over here and draw me a water molecule where I've turned it so that the partially positive end of hydrogen is toward this oxygen. And now I could come in here and draw a dashed line to show my hydrogen bonding. So drawing something like that would have earned your point. You could have also earned the point for drawing this on the other side. Okay, so over here, what would happen is that this being partially positive, the partially negative side would attract. So I could flip that water around here. And then say, hey, the partially negative of this water molecule would attract to the partially positive of the formaldehyde and then I could draw in my attraction like so. So either one of these attractions would have worked, it would have both earned you the point, but on this original question, you only had to draw one of the two. All right, let's look at another problem. 
to see how I might do this for something that's ionic. So you notice here that they've gone ahead and broken up our ionic compound, our calcium and our chloride, um, and they put the charges here on the ions. And so what we want to do is include a particle representation that has four water molecules around the calcium and four water molecules around the chloride ions. So again, we need to remember that water looks something like so and would have a partially negative end on the oxygen and a partially positive end on the hydrogen side of that molecule. So now what I would want to do is illustrate how these would interact here around these ions. Now I will tell you this, rather than drawing the water a little bit further away and doing a dashed or dotted line, we tend to put these waters almost right up to the ion itself and not include the dotted or dashed line. And that's just to show that the water molecules are basically engulfing, they're surrounding these ions, okay? So we get to kind of avoid the issue with drawing in the actual intermolecular force itself. We're just going to draw these waters in the correct direction. So on the calcium, since it has a positive charge, I would want to attract the negative end of the water molecule towards it. And it did say use four. I'm going to draw two of these in the same way, but then I'm going to show you another way you could have drawn this. So sometimes instead of using a Lewis structure, instead they will request that you use a space filling model. Um, they'll actually give you kind of a sample picture of what they would want you to show. And when they do that, a lot of times what they'll have is an oxygen atom with two small hydrogens that are attached. And so as long as you kind of draw your Mickey Mouse water shape with the oxygen toward the calcium, that would also be appropriate. Now I'm gonna go ahead and draw my fourth water molecule in here, since it requested us to go ahead and do that. And so that's the kind of thing you might show if instead we're using a space filling model. All right, now around the chlorine, I will warn you, technically we should have had two of these chlorines. As you can see, the charge doesn't cancel out. But this particular problem didn't address the multimole ratio. It just wanted us to address how those waters would surround our ions. So on the negative ion, the positive hydrogen end would be attracted toward the chlorine. So you could draw it as a Lewis structure, like I'm doing with these. Or again, you could do a space filling model. So you could do something where you had your two tiny hydrogens toward the chlorine, like so. And again, we draw those pretty close to the chlorine, but we try and avoid totally touching it because again, we're not making a complete bond here, but rather just surrounding these and making ion dipole forces between them. All right, hopefully we're feeling confident with identifying a solution, um, figuring out if things are gonna dissolve in each other, as well as drawing these kinds of particle diagrams. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.